So I'm just going to start off and then hand it over to uh, hand it over to Mike. All right. So let's. Okay. So in order to understand why this is important and what kind of systems we're dealing with, I'd like to provide a short story, which I hope will help people really get, you know, like why understanding these questions are, uh, is, is important, right? And this, uh, this information actually comes from a study by ProPublica, which is published about four years ago. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting study that, that people, that a lot of people should, should read and, and really think about as we, uh, as we move forward in, in, uh, in this kind of digital age, right? So consider this. Both of these individuals, Vernon Prater and Brescia Borden, are people who have been uh, processed through the Broward County criminal justice system, okay? Vernon, who is on the left, and you could obviously see his name there, he was caught uh, shoplifting something, which was uh, 8635 uh, worth of tools from Home Depot, right? Okay, Brescia on the right, uh, ha happened to steal an unlocked bicycle and a scooter in the neighborhood that she had lived in. So to dig a little bit deeper into <coughs> the background of these two individuals, um, Vernon was a pretty much a seasoned criminal. He had committed a lot of high level offenses, two armed robberies, and one attempted armed robbery, as well as a, um, as a grand theft, uh, subsequently after he was arrested for this. Right? Brisha, on the other hand, had committed some misdemeanors, um, doesn't specify what exactly those were, and subsequently uh, she had committed none over a two-year period. Now, when both of these people were processed through the criminal justice system, they were assigned a score, which was supposed to inform judges and, and parole officers and other people who have to make decisions about them, whether they were of a kind of low risk or a high risk type. Were they dangerous or were they not, not dangerous? Will they likely reoffend or will they not likely reoffend? And this, uh, what's called a risk score, is determined by what you know we would call a black box algorithm. It's black box because we actually don't know the information that's put into it, but we know that it has to do something with criminal uh, backgrounds that the um, the algorithm makers North Point have uh, ha you know have used in combination with some kind of algorithm to make predictions. So these risks risk scores you know, are used by, as kind of heuristics, by everyone or many individuals in the criminal justice system, from judges, like I said before, the parole officers. And in this particular case, Vernon was assigned a risk score of three, which means that he was low risk, right? Despite his, you know, in, uh, crazy amount of uh, prior offenses. And Risha was actually um, assigned of a, a high risk score of eight. Now this is a scale from one to 10. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, Vernon had subsequently committed a grand, grand theft, I believe it was grand theft auto, and Brigia had not committed any, anything, right? Despite the fact that they were, you know, they were assigned this label in this way. So, um, you know, this might seem concerning in itself because it's an individual case of, of a misrepresentation of, of these two individuals, which can have potentially disastrous consequences uh, for, especially for Breach's life moving forward. And once he gets that label, that high risk label, it's really hard to, um, to, to, to kind of get rid of that, that uh, stigma. Uh, but in fact, it's, you know, if, it, if, if, if this was only the only isolated case, it would, wouldn't be that bad. But as it turns out, uh, this is actually quite systemic. And uh, the study by, <coughs> pardon me, ProPublica, had actually discovered that um, the African American individuals who are assigned these risk scores and processed through the criminal, just the criminal justice system in Broward County 
were overwhelmingly flagged falsely for uh, for being a high risk individual, right? So let's look at some of these numbers here to get a sense of what the, the differences are, okay? So looking at the first row here, right? In this row, these are people who are labeled, the, this is a proportion of people who are labeled higher risk, but did not reoffend. So 23.5% of whites, oops, sorry about that, of whites were labeled higher risk, but did not reoffend. Okay. So that's like, you could consider that to be like the type one error rate, right? It's like a false positive in a way. Like if the risk score is supposed to predict who's going to be a recidivist, right? The, the whites have a 23.5% false positive rate, but look at African-Americans. It's double that. Okay. Almost 44.9%. That means that 44.9% of African Americans who were assigned this risk score were labeled as higher risk but did not reoffend, right? So people like Brisha. Okay. Now look, let's look at the second row. People who are labeled lower risk but did reoffend. So this is the proportion of people who got a low risk score like Vernon, right? But they ended up two years later reoffending. 47.7% of whites were in that situation, just like Vernon. They were considered to be lower risk, but they reoffended, right? Uh, you know, during the course of this study. Whereas only 28% of African Americans were labeled lower risk, but didn't reoffend. Okay. So what you can see from this is that, and then what the you know the ProPublica study points out is that there's there's a systemic bias that uh, is is uh, inherent in the, in the classification system that you know we don't know we we don't know about it or we can't really know about where it's coming from but yet it exists and it's plain as day to see through this analysis. So, in addition to this bias, right, that we can see plainly from the scores themselves, someone has to use those scores, right? I mean, they're not just scores that are just made, to, you know, to throw out into the ether. Like a, another robot is not making a decision on the basis of those scores. There's going to be a person who's interacting with those scores as well. There's going to be a judge. There's going to be a parole officer. Heck, there might even be an employer, depending upon what the requirements are for disclosing information. Okay. And a person is going to look at this bias score and they're going to make their own judgments using their own biases We're using uh, uh, on the basis of this, this score. So what you can see here is that we have two sources of bias when we're thinking about using this information, classifying individuals using these risk scores in the criminal justice system and using this information to make some decisions. We have the bias that's inherent in the algorithm and we have the bias that is inherent in the decision maker. And so, you know, in the case of the decision maker, like the algorithm doesn't see race, right? The algorithm is just sees data and it makes predictions, but the person sees race, right? The person making the judgment, they see, they know their own race, right? And then they know the race of the individual that they're judging, right? So this, of course, ties into, you know, in, in, in many ways into the representative bureaucracy literature in the sense that um, we're curious to understand, well, if the algorithm is biased itself and people have their own biases, <coughs> we want to know if race in any way mediates that, right? We want to know if active representation, of, if having an African-American represent uh, uh, African-American uh, people who come through the criminal justice system, for instance, right? If this helps to ameliorate or lower the bias that is produced by these, these algorithms, right? And if not, well, what exactly happens right? when, you, when you have these kind of interacting sources of bias, and then you also have this additional component of race 
and active representation uh, at, at play. And so the focus of this study is in basically in answering, in answering this question. And I'm going to turn it over to Micah now to do the hard part, which is explaining uh, our formal hypotheses and our, um, our experimental design. So Micah. Well, he hello everyone. And my sincere apologies to Kayla who has seen this, I don't know how many times, but uh, here we go again. Um, let me share my screen and I'll talk with you a little bit about the approach that we're taking here, concretely the approach that we want to take in our um, experimental design, pardon me. So can folks see the um, slides? Great, thank you. So I'll dispense entirely with um, the stuff that I have here by way of motivation, because Jason's got that. Um, so the, the concrete hypotheses that, we're, that we are testing, that we're proposing to test are about same group versus out group evaluations. So if you want to go back to Danny's uh, presentation, right, one of the ways that she could have presented her hypotheses is by coding the interactions to be same versus out group. So in other words, um, when a female Hispanic uh, officer encounters a female Hispanic client, that could be coded as same group interaction. When a female Hispanic officer encounters anybody who belongs to another gender or race group, then that would be counted as an out group interaction. So we're doing something similar here where we're thinking about drawing a sample of white and African American respondents from the general population and exposing those respondents to images that correspond to uh, white or African American targets. Those targets are individuals who wind up in the data set that Jason was just describing to you. So we're going to call our experimental stimuli from that data set. A general theme here is that that means we're uh, taking on um, quite a bit of variation in the treatments that are, that are used. Each treatment uh, has quite a bit of variation within it, and that reflects one of the reasons I like working with Jason is because he's not an experimentalist, he's a statistician by training. And so this, this doesn't bother him at all. He likes, you know, we've got real world stuff and he thinks that's great, doesn't worry. So I, I try to be, let myself be influenced by him. Um, oh, funny, wow, okay, my phone's ringing. Let's, we're gonna not answer that, but please forgive the uh, phone ringing in the background. Um, so let's just talk for a quick second. We do have a moment to do this about the, the mechanisms that might drive what we're describing here as this co-ethnic effect. So basically the idea is when I'm observing someone who belongs to the same group as me, in other words, whose self-reported race is the same as my self-identified race, right? I may be, do a better job. I may be more accurate in the predictions that I make about whether or not that person will reoffend. And there are, a number of reasons why that might happen in the general case. And then what we'd like your feedback on is how relevant those reasons are for the particular case that we're considering here. So if you think in general about me observing, let's say I've got a caseload and I'm looking at images associated with uh, past offenders, descriptions of their background, description of prior offenses, maybe some you know, description of mitigating circumstances or what have you right? Then you can imagine in that setting how bias might operate on my choices, right? The particular setting that we're going to look at takes a lot of that detail, almost all of it, and strips it down, pairs it away, so that instead the person making the decision is really looking at a very limited information set. I'll show you what it is in just a second. I'll show you the actual stimuli. You're going to see it's very limited, okay? So, I think the mechanism that I have listed here that's about contextual information is probably the one that we're gonna need to toss out now that we've resolved our design a little bit. But maybe, maybe not. Other possible pathways for uh, generating this, this um, effect of, of lower bias in same group evaluations could be that when I'm observing somebody who belongs to the same group as me, I'm simply more averse to being inaccurate. In other words, I just care more about getting it right. Um, and then another one could just be a, a simple sort of bias or prejudice explanation. I'm less prejudiced and, and that bias 
uh, uh, that lack of bias uh, allows me to um, not be swayed into making bad decisions. Those are kind of the, the pathways that we might have for observing the, um, this uh, difference in uh, same group versus out group prediction. So here's the second part of this. The second part of this is a sort of difference in differences design, wherein we're looking at those uh, differential error rates for same group versus out group. And then we're going to add this factor of do we or do we not show our respondents these numerical risk scores? So let me just illustrate this for you quickly in a, a figure. So a uh, visualization of this test looks something like this. We're going to random, all of these are randomized conditions, okay? So we're going to randomize subjects into see, being presented with a risk score or not being presented with uh, one of these risk scores. And then after that, they're randomly assigned to the racial condition, the, the race of the target image that they see. And so if you'll look please at the bottom here, the, oh, oops, that's not what we want, sorry. So this comparison is a difference in differences. It's the difference in in-group versus out-group uh, evaluation error rates. So the error rate, if you'll recall from Jason's description of the data, this is generated because we have this special case of a data set with an associated ground truth measure. So this ground truth measure of did this person in fact uh, commit another, were they in fact arrested for another crime in the future, right? And so whenever I ask a respondent to say, hey, do you think this person will be arrested in the future? I can compute the difference between um, that prediction and the ground truth measure, right? And so where that difference is zero, we didn't see an error. And where the signed difference or where the absolute value of the difference is one, we did see an error. Okay? And so I can use that to compute then uh, error rates within groups. So the hypothesis here is looking at the situation where there's no risk score present, we expect to see this difference in error rates in group versus out group, just like we were talking about before. So that logic is clear. Now the idea is when I introduce the risk score, what will happen? Well, the hypothesis that we're carrying forward is that the introduction of the risk score should shrink the importance of group identity. This is, that could have, that might happen that way, might not go that way, but that's the hypothesis that we're carrying forward. And, you know, what's one explanation for this is essentially thinking about, um, a risk score as a heuristic. It's a, it's a tool, it's a shortcut. And the idea is when I'm dealing with a co-ethnic, I have less need for such a shortcut. I'm less willing to depend on such a shortcut. Now I introduce the availability of that shortcut, okay? And my it, error rate in these non-coethnic evaluations shrinks. It gets closer to what it would be, to what that error rate would be were I dealing with coethnics. That's a hypothesis that we're kind of interested in carrying forward here. And um, we did the uh, data description. I would like to see if we can, I think it might be nifty. Let's see how this works. But I might be able to, no, no okay, I've, I got bumped out of sharing my screen, but I'm going to do it again now. So let's, um, let's do this survey together. Uh, ooh, hold on a second. That's interesting. So we're learning something. I got bumped to a page that I didn't want to get bumped to. So f bear with me for a second, folks, as I try to jump back in here and see where this takes me. Oh, no. Okay. we've learned something about. So forgive us, please. This, is a, this was a dry run, folks. And I've, I've learned something now about, um, learned something about the way the link to our survey works. It didn't take me to the page that I anticipated. Let's see. Okay. Oh, dear. Um, so we're skipping 
uh, sorry for that mishap, guys. Uh, we're skipping over the initial part of the survey, but don't worry about that. Um, what we're looking at now are the specific profiles that each respondent will be exposed to. So you'll see reflected immediately in this experimental design what I was talking about before. We've got a very pared down information set that people are being exposed to, right? So whereas in thinking about this problem in general, you could imagine a situation where a person sees a detailed profile with lots of background information, right? That could in fact pretty nicely replicate some of the policy processes that we're interested in here. Instead, what we're doing is really zeroing. So to fill out kind of the background here, we're zeroing in on the characteristics that allow a computer to do a good job of predicting the relevant outcome. Those are the characteristics that we happen to be showing here to humans, okay? And so the idea is that I, as the respondent, I'm gonna go ahead and fill in, do I think this person will be arrested again? Yes, no. As I click through each of these, you'll notice that what I'm seeing is, I'm seeing different racial conditions, okay? I'm also seeing, so here I have information, information pardon me, about an African-American male and their number of prior convictions, but no uh, indication of a risk score, neither numeric nor categorical. So I'm gonna make my prediction. Do I think this person will be arrested again? My, I, in fact, I think yes, but that's because I know the data set really well. I, I bet I'm probably right. Um, but now look at this. Now I have a, my risk score. So I have a numerical measure of the risk score that's on a decimal scale. It right? can take uh, any value continuously from uh, zero to one. And then I have a categorical measure of the risk score. So I'm gonna see eight of these profiles and report my, uh, I'm gonna report my responses to each one, okay? So let's kill out of that and head back over here. By the way, um, the risk score is, I don't know if you're gonna talk about that, Micah, do you want, do you want me to- No, go ahead, Jason, what did you wanna say about it? No, I mean, I just, just to clarify, the risk score was produced by the, an, like, like literally an algorithm which uh, just generated it. And it, it's, and the prediction is out of sample. So in other words, there's like, we train a model, right? To predict how risky an individual is based on certain characteristics. And then we apply that model to the, another set of data. And those predictions on that outside sample, those, those are the ones that are actually within the survey. So it's, a, it's like a real score that, that was produced. Um, just not, I mean, we, we, we would like to use, it would be nice to use the compass ones, but because that was actually in our data set, but um, we don't know how they're generated. So we can't control anything about it. So we just had to, kind of had to generate our own, so. Yeah, so there, the, um, I suppose the last piece that you would need to know is, then we have a, an interesting data set that we can do a few things with, right? So we can compute a we can compute between subjects inference uh, for treating each of those rounds of data separately. So I see my first image, my second image, my third image. The order in which I see the stimuli that appear is randomized between respondents, right? So Qualtrics draws um, first constructs a random ordering of the eight types of profiles, shuffles those types, and then within each type, Qualtrics chooses one of two hundred possible profiles and shows it to me. So if you think of those eight profiles that I see as eight slots, each of our uh, 800 subjects will see one profile in one of those slots. And it's as though we've constructed, uh, we've conducted eight separate between subjects experiments in those slots, okay? And we can show you, you know, in a very agnostic way, we can just plot for you um, the, the um, single difference, right? Which is, were, were co-ethnics, did they have a, a higher or lower error rate than non-coethnics? And then we can also plot the difference in differences. Did that degree of difference change when we introduced the, um, the risk score? So we can do that separately for each of those eight rounds of the experiment. And then we also have the ability to do a within subjects design, right? So each subject has seen uh, all of the types. And so we can compute a difference in error rate within subjects. That's gonna be a pretty high variance quantity, right? But I I'm still interested in it. And uh, you know, I think it'll be uh, that'll be informative. So that's what the analysis will will look like. 
And I think, you know, we're right up against time. So probably I, sh I should stop at this point because I know, Jason, I have a 2 p.m. appointment. I assume, do you as, as well? I do, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I, and mine is with a student and I would not. Yeah, so. I, so I would hate to tell yeah, that student. No, yeah, mine is with a student. Talk with you because if I was busy getting feedback. That would not be. Uh, yeah. Considered. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and, and you know, really, like, I, I wanted to make, I just wanted to make sure that you guys, uh, the other panelists had a chance to present their work. So that's, we're, you know, that's fine. Uh, so I guess we could take like one, one question. I know that we kind of breezed over it relatively quickly, but um, yeah, does anyone have any questions about, about this so far? Or suggestions, comments? Yeah, yeah suggestions obviously are very welcome. <laughs> oh, Seb, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. So yeah, I have to run off also in a few few minutes, have an agency partner meeting. But um, just two very brief comments, one more conceptual and one super, super practical one. I'm wondering kind of if you're going to have a national um, diverse sample, having this Georgia University's um, um, logo serve as some kind of racial prime, given it's um, the, the racial history of the South. Um, yeah, I don't know what that would do, but I just mean like, yeah, but it I'll, I'll see. Make, it, it may make a difference having it versus not having it. So that's yeah, something. that's a good point. That's, a, that's good. a good point. I'll, I'll see what would be involved in getting rid of it. What, what yeah. came to my mind, and um, yes, yeah, so, so I, I may I may not have heard it fully because when you talked about uh, the mechanisms for uh, hypothesis two, um, um, my wife is on a different call, so it was a little bit louder, so I could not fully <laughs> um, get everything, but. I just mean, I'm, I'm wondering if you have thought a little bit about the notion of statistical discrimination here. Um, um, because like the idea is basically you, you, you're, an, you're a discriminator in a, in, a, in a way based on group inferences and direct information would, would give you or could kind of would rule out the need for using, using group level information to, to statistically discriminate individuals. And um, I'm wondering if this is differential for uh, people who are co-ethnicists and not co-ethnicists. And the idea is that co-ethnicists have more um, accur accurate in-group information than those who have not. Um, yeah. I don't know if that, that, that is a case or not, but this is kind of a theoretical route you may want to think yeah, about. Yeah, no, th this is so helpful, Seb. Thank yeah, you so much. It's very much in line with the way that we've presented it thus far. It's just a much better way of presenting it. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks, thanks very much for that. That's, that's really awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, cool, cool design, cool design. Okay, thank you. I guess, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there. Um, sorry about sorry about our last presentation. But hey, at least you guys, uh, you know, you came and you contributed to this and uh, we were able to, uh, you're able to get feedback and hopefully that will help you. And um, yeah, it was really wonderful uh, meeting everyone. All right. Thanks so, everybody. Uh, hope, yeah. I hope everyone has a great day and uh, hope to see you in person. Yep. <laughs> when that starts again. Yep. Yeah. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.